<laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hadley Matters. And today we have with us Jane Nevin Smith. You know she wears many hats in Hadley, so we're going to talk about those hats, but we're also going to talk about how she got to all those hats. And we have two people in our circle today. Rosalie and Joan are with us and should feel free to participate as you will. The oddity about this interview for me, Sharon Howard, that I forgot to introduce, is that I know Jane. Jane and I are friends. Of all the episodes we've taped, that has never been true. I've always been learning about people. So this may have just a slightly different tone to it. So one of the things that I want to talk about first is my perception of Jane as a friend is that she has two qualities which I admire. One of them is she loves to serve. And the second one is she's a problem solver. Now many of us have good ideas. Not many of us are good at putting them into action. It is one of the things that I have learned to really appreciate about you, Jane. I know, turn red for me. We <laughs> so, Jane Nevin Smith, why are you a problem solver? And why have you come to feel that your life is one of service? Very different questions. Two parts to it. Two parts. All right, part Take a. whichever you like first. Part A. How did I come to be a problem solver? My parents, my father especially, raised me to look at things and if they weren't working, figure out how they worked. And his one, one advice that I remember is, you look at something and you decide, did God make it that way? And if God <laughs> didn't make it that way, you can take it apart and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> what so, a great thing to teach you as a child. As, as a young child. So, I, and I was always taking things apart, always using tools, always mm -hmm. playing. And I also have really good spatial relations, which helps immensely in problem solving. Because a lot of problems are, what will that fit? Will that work? And I can just see that relatively easily. So. Mm -hmm. And so that has helped you make problems sometimes get fixed. Yes. Jane has what I have called an engineering brain. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about here, although you have no formal engineering training, or well, do you? I have no scholastic engineer training. I worked for an engineer writing a program text in thermodynamics and then selling ads for textbook reviews which I managed for him and so and so my oldest daughter who is the engineer I never was <laughs> at one point when she was three and I was working with this guy I put ice in my coffee cup and she came over and said why'd you do that I said I'm creating thermal equilibrium <laughs> and that's so from then on anybody put ice in a drink that's what Martha said He's creating thermal equilibrium. <laughs> I would note that for those of you who don't know what thermodynamics is, you're not alone. I don't either. <laughs> but she was able to write a text about it. No, no, I no? just I, A program text is something that came out of the 60s. And basically, if you wanted to teach somebody something, you said something in sentence, the first sentence, and you ask them a question about what you had just said. So... Okay. So it's, it was a, a thought of a new way of teaching things. Oh, okay. So. Uh, you ready to go on to the second part of the question, which is... Why am I a server? Yeah. Um, Other than this is something I tease Jane about, enjoying control. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's good at it, so it's okay. My <laughs> parents were always volunteering and serving. Really? My mother never worked, but she transcribed uh, novels into Braille. Really? She had a machine that was six keys and a combination of those six little dots. So someone, this was way back, I was in elementary school and junior high when she, I remember okay. her doing this. Um, someone would call up the Library of Congress and say, I really want to read Moby Dick. And so 
they would send her the book and she would start typing and there was combinations that went together to make different shortcuts and everything so she did probably five or six books a year wow. for people. It sounds kind of lucky in her parents, doesn't it, in that one had that kind of engineering brain, I call it, and the other was a volunteer server. And so you learned very early. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't know you could did anything else. I mean, that was the example I had. So then I got married, and I had children, and... I wanted to make my children happy, but I didn't want to make them uh, dependent on me, so they learned to be very self-sufficient, but I was always behind them, supporting them. You have some wonderful anecdotes that I've heard over the years about your children and how you taught them things, <laughs> and I wonder if you might think about one of those an teaching stories that you did as a parent, and it was with the purpose of teaching your child something. And you, they, she has, by the way, five children. I have five children. The oldest is 61. The youngest is 53. <laughs> Oops. 53. Barbara, I, do not watch 52. this. No, that's Mark. <laughs> oh, Mark, sorry. <laughs> um, so, Tony, Tony my ex-husband, uh, went on sabbatical and we rented a place on a lake and we had two small girls at that point and so we had a boat and we would go out and we would go upstream and find turtles sitting on logs and we would record where we found them and we'd write a number on their back and we'd take it home with us and then we'd turn it loose and it would swim back upstream and they always went back to where we found them. So recording scientific evidence, it, well, I didn't think of it that way. I was still a kid when I had these kids, so I was still having fun. <laughs> I was the mother, but I was having fun with them. Uh -huh. The other thing I did was dinner time in the fall, and not wanting children under your feet while you're cooking. I think everybody understands that. <laughs> I would send them out with a thermometer on a string to take the temperature of the lake water and come back and put it on graph paper. So they watched the lake freeze, which was... And, really by the way, stayed out of your hair... And stayed out of my <laughs> while hair. ...while you prepared. <laughs> I'm going to do another thing, which is to say, if there's anything either of you want to pursue, question, along the lines of what we're talking about, I'm asking Rosalie and Joan to do that. I have one thing that I've always enjoyed, many things I've enjoyed in relationships with Jane over taking cruises and three-day trips and one-day trips and so forth. Um, but Jane has a wonderful sense of humor, and I, that I've, I've met two of your children, and they have wonderful humor. <laughs> so I'd like to hear more about maybe your parents. Was there humor in your home growing up, or is there anything unique about... Yeah. Because I just think that's a, that's a common thing. I've been in situations on board ship where there's been a crisis, but you're always calm, and and mm -hmm. that calmness spreads to everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if you can't fix it, let it be. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, to me, exemplifies Julian of Norwich, for those of you who know her, who says, all will be well, all will be well, all will be exceeding well. And I think that is what you put out there. Right. But it's a good question, Joan, about the humor. Where does that come from in Jane's life? And it also spreads, the humor also spreads an aura of optimism, mm. and that mm -hmm. which ties in with what you just said, said God and Sharon. I don't remember a lot of humor as I was growing up, but I know um, that with kids, you lighten things up <laughs> by making them funny. And with old people. And with old people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Rosalie, do you anything else? Okay, let us move along to your personal history. Uh, you married Tony Nevins. I did. You had, he and you raised five children to a point. Yes. Okay. Then we got divorced. Okay. I left him for a woman. Mm -hmm. We lived in the same town for a couple of years, and then I got a job offer. We 
I got a job offer from a man who worked at UMass that I had worked for writing that program text and thermodynamics and I said I he said why aren't you working for me and I said you didn't ask he said I just asked you <laughs> so I came down here and was general manager of an energy systems company where we manufactured solar collectors for hot water and installed heat pumps and did heat recovery. So. You, I believe, told me at one point that you worked on, was it Ingleside Mall? Oh, yeah, we had the contract for both Hampshire and Ingleside Mall to put in the heating and air conditioning for Pyramid. Oh, okay. So that gave me familiarity with blueprints, so Senior Center comes along, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> All right, so you're here in Hadley now. I'm here in Hadley. How many of your children are with you? So I started with two, mm -hmm. and then one was already in college, so Tony had two, I had two. We actually each wanted all of the children, so that was fine. And we decided when we were getting divorced that um, we were not gonna let the children play each other against us. That the issue was between us and not with them, and they needed to, <clears throat> excuse me, be stabilized. So, hold <coughs> on just a second there. Too much yeah. pollen in the air. Oh, there is lots right now, isn't there? So we're continuing along with Jane's life history and leaving her husband, or she, uh, and he splitting, at any rate, two children in each family. Where was he at this point? He was at the University of New Hampshire. Okay. And I had actually gotten a job there at the University of New Hampshire in the Affirmative Action Office. It was in the 1970s when Affirmative Action had just started. And so I was the administrative assistant and I went <clears throat> to all the training programs for faculty members so that they would understand the implications of why you had to not play the old boys network and you really had to look at people for their character and their capabilities as opposed to who knew them. So. That was a learning experience, I suspect. It was also a learning experience because I, at that point, I had assumed that all women were just like me because if you don't have any other samples, that's what you know. And they weren't. And I was like, <laughs> say, why not? What happened? Where didn't they get this? You know, why don't they know which end of a hammer to hold? Why don't they? Mm -hmm. So it was just very amazing to me that my skills were different. Did your dad teach you to hold a hammer? He used that as a metaphor. As a very young child. And wow. By the time my parents went to first grade parents night where girls did home did shop and the boys did home ec. Yes. Parents were complaining about why does my daughter have to do this? <laughs> and the teacher said, there's one little girl in here who not only knows the name of every tool, but knows how to use it. So, <laughs> <laughs> What was your experience with your children in the Hadley environment, including school and neighborhood and all that? I love Hadley. It's got a small enough town that everybody knows everybody else. And that worked really well for me because one day I saw a friend, a parent, who said, oh, I saw your kids at the mall yesterday. <laughs> that night at dinner, I said, oh, I hear you went to the mall, <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> so it, it's good. It keeps people in line, you know. I was they lucky. know. <laughs> I was lucky because my kids are all athletic, and so they were immediately accepted in Hadley, which mm -hmm. likes athletes. So, uh, Tell us where your five children have ended, starting with Martha, the scientist. Martha, the engineer. engineer. The engineer who um, actually has just retired from WPI, where she, yeah, that makes me <laughs> old, where she um, worked on the STEM program for the state, and she was also- Science, technology, technology engineering, engineering, and, and math, math. For STEM. women. For women. Especially for women. And she was doing a lot of training for teachers, which was, she really liked that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, who is also retired, <laughs> is out in California. She was rowing coach at University of Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And number three? Number three is son Scott. He and his wife, or oh, back to Martha, she lives in Charlton with her husband. They have two children, and now we have a great grandchild. Um, yes. Scott lives with his wife in South Carolina. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. They are both truck drivers, big 18-wheeler trucks. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My daughter Barbara lives in Philadelphia and she works at the University of Pennsylvania and she does, I'm never sure of the name of it, basically she runs the supply lab for chemistry and biology. So if you need anthrax samples or test tubes, she's got it, you go through her. So, What's her background? Is there, did, was she educated in science for that? Only by living with us. She dropped out of school like I did after a year. Uh -huh. And I, I asked because, again, that brain that Martha has, that Barbara has. Um, yeah, yeah. This and your youngest? And my youngest, Mark, um, lives in Belchertown with his wife, and they have two children, and he teaches at Smith Oak. Uh, and two of the five you and Tony adopted. Two of the, boy, the boys are adopted. The boys are adopted, and this, uh, the, the girls, girls are, are biological. Mm -hmm. For which we to thank Tony, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Good. All right, so you are in Hadley. Yes. And you clearly have to make a living. So for a while you're doing the solar collector engineering firm. Then. So, I, so I have to back up because I just told this story to someone else. When I got divorced, it never occurred to me that I would not be able to make a living. It just was not on my mind. But people started saying later, well, when you got divorced, weren't you afraid of, you know, not having any money or make, and you had these kids? I said, never occurred to me that it was something to even think about. So. Which is a little bit amazing in the time we're talking. Yeah, because women were not allowed to have credit cards. What year did you and Tony divorce? 76. 76. And you all probably, were you aware at that point of how restricted some of the things for women were? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolute? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you both had husbands, so getting a credit card would not have been an issue. Credit cards were not really big things. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. You, pay, you paid in cash. You exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mom would keep money in her cabinet, and she knew just how much it had to last the month <laughs> or whatever. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, but I guess, for me, the first time I realized I was living in Texas, I'd had, uh, it was I had three kids. And five of us are come from five different states. Mm -hmm. And my my baby was six weeks old and had meningitis. And I couldn't sign for procedures that need to be done in this critical time. Wow. My husband had to be called from work. They needed the mail signature. And this was in Texas at that point. Yes. Yes. So you did face. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Very different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so after the uh, firm you worked for, you did that for two or three years? Right, and then I started a business. I had read this article about the business shut down because the owner decided he didn't want to focus on that anymore. Um, so I'd read this story about a woman who had a business called Rental Life. And I thought, what a great name. It says women can do things. They're really competent. I'm going to do that. What did I know about copyright laws? So <laughs> I started right away. Um, and my brother called me up and said, you've got to be kidding me. What are, you know, what is, what is this? What are you going to say when somebody calls up and wants sex? I said, never occurred to me. <laughs> and he said, well, you've got to have an answer because it will happen. And did it? And it did. But he gave me the answer. The answer was, what, with you for $10 an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. It was perfect. So you stayed with the rental wife as a, as a name? For a year, and then I was contacted by the woman who actually owned the name and who the article had been written about, and she said, send me money, you're using my name, and I said, sorry, changed my name. So I became Jane of all trades. I am now Jane of less trades. <laughs> And how long did you do that? From 1982 until 2006. So my quick math says about 24 years. I had um, an office in Northfield, so we had Jane of the North, because the office manager there name was also Jane, <laughs> because we did household-related services. Okay. And I had a lot of people. At one point, we had 19 people between wow. the two offices. Mm -hmm. 
doing household things. At first, I never believed people would want house cleaning, but uh -huh. that turned out to be something they wanted steady, reliable. Yes. Every week or two, yes. Which was great because it got out that I was more than happy to hire mothers while their kids were at school. Mm -hmm. And these mothers would make, you know, they'd get known to their clients, they went to the same place, and they'd say, oh, would you mind if I came tomorrow instead of today because my daughter's in the school play? Oh, no, of course. So it, everybody was happy. That's it was great. good. Well, I suspect a woman-owned business has a different uh, business philosophy, if you will. You do wonderful anecdotes sometimes, so I'm going to again ask you if in that 24-year period you have any cute or funny or horrific. shocking, horrific. horrific stories that you might want to share, because again, we call you a problem solver. So if somebody calls up and says, I want sex, you have a great answer. What happens in Jane of all trades uh, when you ask for things that... Well, we had a variety of people. I had one person who was really good at woodworking. Okay. One person who was really good, like myself, probably a clone, but a guy, <laughs> at everything else. But he loved to clean, too. So oh. he ultimately was my general manager. But we could pretty much fix anything. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would just go out there without ever having done it before and make it happen. So, mm -hmm. so nothing horrific, huh? Many. We won't talk about them. <laughs> Okay. Now, somewhere along this line, um, you and Diane, her wife, have been together for 36 years. That's true. So, when did you meet? Do you want to talk about that at oh, all? Dear, or do you just want to go? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It was at, uh, yeah. Well, we've talked about this because. 1986. I think the thing I love the most about your story there is that one time I asked you, how did you and Diane make that connection? How did you know? Do you remember my asking you that? Just tell they me what I Ro said. No, they were at Row Camp. Okay. And she was up there, and Diane was up there. Oh, and I re okay, I remember. It was the first night, and it's, I was collecting silverware, and Diane comes up with her tray, hands me her silverware, and I say, I know you. So we played, well, how do I know you? Well, I live in Belcher, Jeff. I live in Hadley. Do you go here? No. Do you go there? No. Do you do this? Do you do that? So we were just striking out all over the place. <laughs> and she said, well, what do you do? And I said, I have a business called Jane of All Trades. That's how I know you. <laughs> Her wife had hired Jane of All Trades to clean their house. Uh -huh. And Bob, my general manager, had called and said, I need this other piece of equipment. So I drove it out to him. And she saw me, 30 seconds maybe. That was it. And what you said to me that I remember around that story is, I felt like I had known her before. I, I do. I do. I think that's why it's really working so well for us. Okay. okay, anything about all that? Because we're going to switch tracks and start talking about her hats that she wears in Hadley. But is there anything? I love that John and Rosie over there are also <laughs> paying attention. Got anything you want to say? This is the moment. <laughs> Good. Okay. So let's go to the hats you wear around here. We know that you have five kids, that you live in Hadley, that you are married to Diane for 36 years. So that well, you we have. not legally be married for 36 years. We've you've been, been together, together for 36, 36 years. years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. So. So um, this go back about three years. Go no, ahead. No, I want to. I want to go back. The kids were in school. I was okay. doing parent things. I taught little lassie league. I coached. Uh -huh. I did things that were appropriate parent things. Um, and then, when I turned sixty, I got this newsletter from the senior center saying. Welcome to the Senior Center. You're 60. <laughs> so I read it, and it was like, wow, this is exciting. And then there's this little paragraph that said, we're looking for a van driver. Call if you're interested. And I, oh, oh, I love to drive. <laughs> oh, but everybody loves to drive. See, there's the same thing. I assume because I do, everyone does. Mm -hmm. Nobody else wanted the job, so they <laughs> gave it to me, <laughs> which was great. And that's how I started doing trips for the Senior Center, because at first I would drive people from Golden Court to the Hooker School for lunch, and then I graduated from that task, and I was able to drive people shopping, 
and maybe on some kind of a trip like to the theater, but not mostly it was shopping and lunch. And these people were saying to me, Jane, we don't need to shop. We really want to travel and our kids don't want us to go off alone. They need somebody to organize for us. And so I started organizing trips and what year? Do you remember? Well, it must have been uh, 64. 64? No, not 64. I think you said. 2004. Really? Yeah. Was it that long? Because you started driving the van when you were 16. Okay. Yeah. So you've been doing that for 18 years now. Yes. Yes. Okay. And love it. I love it because I get to go, I pick places that I want to go anyway. <laughs> and then some people want to go there and some people don't want to go mm -hmm. there and that's mm -hmm. fine. However it is, but... That was your first involvement with Senior Center, the van driving, right. organizing trips. Right. Okay. Then uh, that pretty much stayed that way until Jane Booth was retiring. And so I got on the search committee to find the new director, who we ultimately hired Suzanne Trabizano. Mm -hmm. And she hadn't been in her position for very long and she had to go out for surgery mm. and at that point Elsie Waskevitz who had been on the desk had taken ill and was in the hospital mm -hmm. so there was really no one in the office. Where were we at this point as in a senior the, center? In the hooker school. In the hooker school. And it was much smaller, very few activities. Um, Carla Rabiak is Elsie's Sister. sister, I think, yeah. And so she understood Elsie's system of filing and everything. So basically, Carla and I took over running the building while there was nobody else there. Yep. <laughs> and that's Jane in a nutshell. We could terminate the interview right here. <laughs> okay, so Suzanne's in the hospital. She comes back she out. She comes back, and she's been there for a year, and she says, I really want to have a meeting with the people who come here and find out what kind of programs they want. Do they need more exercise? Do they want cooking classes? Do they want, what is it? So I'm gonna have a general meeting. We'll have refreshments and we'll have, keep a flip chart. I'll write everything down, they say. So we had about 60 people show up at that meeting. Wow, I'm impressed. Yeah. Okay. Because a lot of people knew what they wanted and every <laughs> single one of them said, we want a new building. Suzanne came away from that saying, it's not what I expected. Mm -hmm. and that is not what I was looking for. <laughs> she thought she'd get programs, and instead she got a building. <laughs> she got a building. A nice idea. Town has no money. That's not going to happen. Um, but fortunately, thanks to the library, the library was getting a state grant to build a new library, and the only spot that the town felt was appropriate to put it was on the spot of the Hooker School, which meant the seniors needed somewhere to go. So we made that all happen. <laughs> that was a process, too, as it I was recall. A process. You know, it was a process. It was a process. push comes to shove. <laughs> to shove. <laughs> well, you think about the ha ha population in Hadley, and I don't know if other towns are this, but a, a third of the... A third of Hadley is seniors. Is seniors. So, um, yeah. And the seniors were really active. In order to get it on the town warrant to vote for the money for it, you had to have 100 signatures. We got 600. Oh, wow. Which says there was support. Yeah, So absolutely. So anytime we needed a vote for something, seniors came out and said, yes, we want this. Staff at that point, too. Jane, you mentioned Elsie um, so part-time and Suzanne on, and you volunteered. Well, Elsie was no longer there. But now Elsie's, yes. Elsie's gone. She's gone. So we start with volunteers at that point on reception, but it was still... The hooker school was upstairs, downstairs, mm -hmm. and reception was not near any door. It was a very confusing place. Mm -hmm. um, and the elevator was hard to work. The elevator <laughs> didn't work. Work. <laughs> If you enjoyed alone time, you might get stuck there for a little while. <laughs> I've been stuck in that elevator. Violet was there. Violet had been hired by Violet them. Because I remember we had some part-time We had part-time people. people. But Violet came in, and Violet was there. We had a couple of part-time outreach coordinators. Ah, yes. But then, yep, and then Violet came on board while we were still at Hooker. Violet was on at Hooker. We made yes the office behind her office. I remember doing that. Yep. 
and then um, Lauren came on just before we moved to Most Holy Redeemer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're still here. And they're still here. And you're still here. And I'm still here. It's for a just, while. <laughs> yeah, for a while. Today I interviewed another candidate for my position. Good. Uh, those of you who don't know, they have put a half-time position to re... Well, I'm not sure replace is the right word, but to take some of the jobs that Jane has been doing as a volunteer. So the town, again, has supported the seniors, I think, very nicely. Yes. How many new positions were in the budget? That was it. One. One. One half time, even. <laughs> yeah, one half time. So somebody will be coming on board to help with yes, that. Yes, yes, and I think that's appropriate mm -hmm. because I'm now in my other hat mm -hmm. and chair of the select board. <laughs> Which brings us to another part of your life. So while the senior center was being built, I was on the building committee because I had all those hammer skills. <laughs> and, and the part that was really fun was I could read the blueprints. So um, the first meeting after the architects gave us some plans, I went home and I spread them out on the table and I read them. And I made notes about things that were not compatible, things that just didn't make sense to me. So I came back with two handwritten pages of questions. And the architect looked at it, and the owner's project manager looked at it, and they said, do you want to work for us? Both of them. <laughs> so, so you worked with them. I worked with them, and I got a great deal of respect because I understood what I was doing. Absolutely. So, and if I said, I don't think it should be that way, they really listened. So, All right. Well. So, so you I had to attend select board meetings because they were always talking about well they're doing this and oftentimes they didn't have the full story and so I wanted to be there to correct it because the times I hadn't been there it always was for trouble so I started sitting in all the meetings and I was fascinated with all the things that happened in this town that nobody thinks about when you're just doing your life mm -hmm. And the more I thought about it, the more curiosity I had, and I said, I really want to do this. So when the center was finished and... Time opened up. Time opened up. <laughs> a position opened up on the select board. I ran for office. And three years now is two years. This I is your third, third year on the board. Right. Okay. And now I am chair. And now, this year, you're chair. Right. And you have kind of a half a... Half a Different board, too, so different board, yes. life may be different. Uh, you've only been chair for two or three weeks now, so yes, I'm two, wondering... Two meetings. Two meetings. Three weeks. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you have any sense of direction yet, or what are the major issues on the select board table? Anything that you feel comfortable sharing well, out here? One of the issues is that the town has for the last four years, two because of COVID and two previously just because inflation was happening and people were not willing to pay more taxes has kept the tax rate very low. Mm -hmm. And that's put us in a really bad position in terms of um, hiring people. Be off, for instance, the police department now hires people, fire department also, and they're paying them almost minimum wage. And we're talking about trained personnel, people who are truly putting their life on the line. So, you know, somebody could shoot them, a fire could kill them, whatever. And we're paying them, you know, $20 an hour. That's, wow. I mean, that's not exact, but it's in that range. So what happens? I know what would happen if I were, you know, trained here in and Hadley. Somebody offers you a job somebody for more says. money. And they we, we are often having people taken from us. So we have to figure other ways to get money. One of them is not to raise taxes, but to figure out how to get more businesses on Route 9 that mm. will provide income mm -hmm. to the town mm -hmm. or alternative methods. I'm not saying we aren't going to raise taxes. I'm not saying we're not it's talking wrong. about it, but ultimately it may come to that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We have a great finance committee that is so good with numbers. Mm -hmm. they bless their hearts. But you have just said something that I suspect may trouble some folks. Oh, I'm sure it will. Okay. But you can't have things if you're not willing to pay for them. 
Um, salaries for people, I'm hearing, are one of the things that would uh, be on the docket that you might hope to achieve. Mm -hmm. Anything else? That's well, this town is very old, as you know, 1659. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. 50. Um, and the water, you know, water mains. The old pipes do serious trouble. Okay. The so roads are old. Replacement. That's not cheap. You have to dig it up mm. and you have to buy it and you have to put it in and you have to close it up and repave it. So when Route 9 is done, the town has worked with the state and will save the town about a million dollars to replace the pipes under Route 9 when that's dug up. Huh? Which is a very clever plan. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, uh, you both, are there issues, John, Rosalie, are there issues that are priorities for you that you think would improve life in Hadley? Is there anything? Well, when we walk down at the mall, there are an awful lot of, of stores that have closed in the past two years that it's just really been heartbreaking to see one and then the next one go and the yeah. next one go. Yeah. And it'd be good to see those come back. Hopefully. I think that people changed their style of shopping during COVID. They yes. didn't want to go out and they learned to go online. And the local merchants, whether they're big box stores or mom and pop stores, all suffered. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good. Malls oh. are now turning more into um, activity destinations than shopping. Mm -hmm. Game Gaming. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I actually went axe throwing yeah. at Christmas. <laughs> a family. I understand. A family group. <laughs> family axe throwing. The family that axes together. <laughs> About anything more on that front? No? Okay. Um, one of those questions that flew in and flew out of my brain. You connect to many different smaller groups and committees, probably through your select board work yes. and through your interests. Yes. Can you share some of those um, groups that you are connected to? Well, interesting, last night at select board meeting, we just realigned all the liaisons for committees. Mm -hmm. And so everybody has a new one. The town has, well, 19 that we chose, but that's really not a full list because one of them that I picked was um, Human Services, mm -hmm. but that's Board of Health, Council on Aging. Um, see, I don't even know yet. That's okay, but it's <laughs> but you know, one multiple choice may well, make. <laughs> so, so the liaison is supposed to be available to the department or the committee mm -hmm. as a go-between to the select board. So if there's something going on, and you either need input from the select board or want to tell the select board, mm -hmm. this is a, a ready conduit. And mm -hmm. so we will visit those departments and committees, not to, especially the committees, not to be voting members on them, but to help guide them. Mm -hmm. Many of them, I think there are 14 committees that have been appointed by the select board. Things like the Agricultural Committee, the Diversity Committee, the Climate Change Committee. Mm -hmm. And some of those involve your time also. Well, yeah, I enjoy it because they're amazing. We, I was on the Climate Change Committee as liaison. They put on the most amazing um, Climate Awareness Day here mm -hmm. back in April. They had top-notch speakers mm -hmm. and I was really impressed. One of the speakers um, had studied ice melt in Antarctica for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So, and had all of this information about, you know, it's true, what they say is mm -hmm. true. And we all see it now. You know, the farmers noticed it last year. Their crops were not easy to manage, if at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about housing, and I'm thinking about that partially because one of the issues I think in Hadley is affordable housing. How do you, old families in this town, the next generation or the next generation can't afford to live here, affordable housing. Uh, we have some senior housing in town. Uh, that's another 
a whole area that needs somebody to liaison with it. Am I right? So we have an affordable housing committee, and okay. Molly Keegan is on that. She's also been on that for several years. Uh -huh. And I think they're doing some really good work, and they're working with the planning board because part of what causes housing problems are zoning laws. So you can zone, you can only have single family houses here, or Hadley has zoned, you cannot have apartment buildings. So we don't have apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe zoning needs to be looked at. It feels like every item has so many tentacles. It does. That's coming out of it. One of the things I was fascinated is I watched the select board. All these things are going on and nobody knows. And nobody knows. <laughs> mm -hmm. and nobody knows the interconnections. Please. Um, with Vesta off of Greenleaves Drive. Yes. Now that's an those are apartment buildings. So there. low income housing, the government has set up a thing. If you are building low income housing, you don't have to go by local zoning bylaws. Okay, but I didn't think all of those buildings back in there were all low income. Yes. They are. Yes. Oh my gosh. There are two, two sections. Seniors, and then there's the family housing in the back. Okay. But you have to meet certain income Got guidelines it, yeah. to live there. Okay. Yeah, okay. Any more, Jane? I'm uh, not thinking of anything else, but that doesn't mean with your many hats that you may not have <laughs> some things you want to make sure to get down for posterity. No, no, I think we've done enough. You think we're good? Yep. I have a comment. Yeah. Go, John. We're on the air. Yes. Um, I've watched, so I was working at Hadley Media when we were in the Hooker School, in the basement of the Hooker School. I remember. <laughs> and um, I've watched this all go down over the last few years. I've watched the meetings. I've had to watch all the meetings. Yes. <laughs> I've watched all the meetings. I've watched this place come from nothing to this, this building. And I just got to say, I'm just blown away at everything that you've done for, um, for, the, for this, this thing to to and I'm having fun. That's the whole thing. <laughs> I am That's still a having a lot of fun. Yeah. And so another great. thing that I really love about Jane is that she doesn't need all the credit. So when you say those things, you will often, as I said, here's Jane, and then here's, well, I need also to thank Suzanne Travisano, and I need to thank... The whole building thank, committee. Absolutely. Yep. She recognizes how much it takes. I'm a leader, but I also need people to lead. So. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Good way to end, Jane, our leader? <laughs> we'll follow. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you.